Hey, everyone. Um, so my name is Julia Borelli. Uh, I'm here today to talk a, a bit about mixing and mastering. Um, you probably already know what it is, but um, I, what I would say that mixing and mastering are is, is the la last creative step on the music, uh, the creative side of uh, making music. And I see my job as just to make the goosebumps of the track for the listener. Right? That's, in, in a simple way, that's, that's uh, how I see what I'm doing. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about me. Uh, so I've always been interested in music and learning instruments. And I started playing guitar when I was seven. Uh, then I had this obsession of learning a new instrument every two years, which uh, maybe was, uh, yeah, it, it gave me a little bit of an insight of an each instrument, not a master in any of them. But it, it, I would say that it helps me today a lot in what I do. Um, so in how I got to engineering was the usual story. Uh, I was playing in a band. We had to record uh, our first EP. And, and then I was the crazy one that decided to go in and try out how a microphone works and all these things. And then we did our first EP then. And I went to London for six months to do a diploma in music production. And, and that's where I saw that, like, before that, I didn't really understand what mixing was or mastering was. But I, saw, I learned more of what a compressor was and all these things that you would expect to be the most important thing in mixing and mastering. Then when I went back to Brazil, uh, I'm from Brazil, by the way. Um, yeah, so I started working in a mastering studio called Postmodern Mastering. And I would say that that's where I actually learned how to, how to understand music and how, to, how mastering actually is, or even mixing. And there I was working mostly actually in uh, Brazilian popular music, which is kind of like more acoustic guitar and also jazz a lot. And after that, I still felt like I needed to learn more because I thought a school would teach me more than actually working in the studio. And so I came to Germany to study because we, we didn't have good schools in Brazil. And I did my bachelor's in SAE. And then I stayed. So, and then after I, I graduated, I opened my studio, which is Nadoki. And now, uh, after three years of studio uh, and a lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of sleepless nights, a couple burnouts, and a lot of obsessions in the smallest details on every project that I work on. Uh, now I'm working with people like uh, Richie Ahaten, uh, Stefan Bodzin, Anima, Mind Against, Kevin DeVries, and these other uh, really nice people, um, and labels as well. Uh, so I wanted to understand a little bit more about you guys. Uh, are you engineers, producers, just interested? Yeah, both. Both? both? Cool. Both. Yeah. Also, engineer and producer? Yeah. Cool. And you? I used to be an engineer, but now it's just hobby. Ah, nice. Cool, nice. And what kind of music are you? Um, like industrial breakbeat. Oh, cool, nice. And you arrived late, so we're, I'm asking, what are what are you doing, producer, yeah, uh, engineer? I'm a producer and DJ, uh, but yeah, also hoping to be able to do a little bit more better mastering of my, of my own on my own tracks, cool. especially for demos and things like that. Cool, nice. And you? Yeah, me too. I'm a producer, sound engineer. Ah, cool. Nice. These two are not, I'm not asking. <laughs> and you? Are you an engineer, producer? I Ah, cool. Well, I already know you. She's an engineer. And you? Oh, there's a mic. Nice. I am a DJ and producer. I wouldn't call myself that I'm engineer, but I am doing your job or trying to do your job. Cool. <laughs> yeah, DJ. I'm also trying. 
uh, DJ and producer here as well. Uh, I do mixing as well. Nice, cool. I am a DJ and a producer, but I would rather uh, consider myself as an engineer uh, for post production. Cool, nice. Uh, also, a producer and trying to get into management stuff. So, oh, cool. But I'm also, really interested in mixing. So that's nice. What I'm doing. DJ and producer. Cool. Ooh, I, I can't go there. Got it. Right, so, is the mic even working or are we just pretending? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> all right. So I don't know. I would uh, describe myself as the typical bedroom producer, I guess. Also, um, a DJ a bit, um, mix, produce, record my own stuff. Also, master my own stuff. So, I hope uh, I get to learn something new today. But no. oh, let's see. All right. <laughs> so yeah, but that's basically what I do. <laughs> I'm your neighbor. Um, music and event producer. Oh, cool. Data analyst. Uh, oh, wow. Played drums, though, and cool. getting into music production, so I would love to know more about mustering for cool. as if I'm your dumbest brother. Okay, got it. It's my next question, actually, so... The other neighbor. <laughs> hey, good Mixing, to see mastering, you. 20 years, <laughs> and now artist production. Nice. I'm also a DJ and a producer, and I'd also like to learn a bit about mastering because I think that as a producer you can um, do a lot of work for the mastering if you know what's going to happen in the mastering. It's yeah. good to know it in the process of producing. Cool. Uh, at this point, an aspiring producer, and basically to see how much trouble I can get into trying to get into the mastering world. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, yeah, also producer and DJ and also label owner, but this guy. Ah, nice. Should I say it again? Let me the... guess, producer. Yes. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of producers. Over there, producers? Yeah. Engineers? Producer. DJ producer. DJ producer, cool. Nice. So I, I think it's safe to say that 95% are producers, but nowadays being a producer and engineer goes together very often, right? So I guess someone already uh, answered my question. So I was going to ask how technical I should go. So I will go basic, but also show a little bit of what I do in general. So I wanted to, I'm going to also cover a little bit of mixing because uh, I'm doing both. And I feel I'm doing it. Everything that I mix, I'm also mastering 99% of the time. And, and then I also do just mastering. But I feel like I can uh, teach, tell more about mixing, uh, although they go together. Um, or the, the point here is the same. So I wanted to, so I'll tell you a, li a little bit about how I see mixing and mastering. So in an analogy of uh, how I see a track when I see when I start working on it. The philosophy that I have behind it, which I, for me, it's the most important thing. I'll tell tell you a little bit about my workflow as well, and I'll open some projects to show you um, a session. And in the end, we have questions. Yeah. So, for me, when I'm working on a track, how how I see mixing is basically. As if you have a table with a lot of uh, stuff, and I'm a Virgo, so I like things organized. So when I'm mixing, all I'm seeing is I have a kick, I have a snare, and I have space. And I want to put them, I have space to the sides, I have depth, I have up and down. And I have to find space for everything, because if everything is in the same space, no one will be able to understand or hear that, those elements. So it's finding space for all these elements. And then with mastering is just tweaking and aligning these elements to be placed comfortably in, in those positions and making it louder most of the time as well. Um, oops. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when I was working in the studio in Brazil, um, I'll go a little bit this way. Does it help with the feedback? Yeah. Um, uh, so. 
when I started working in the studio in Brazil, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, so it was one engineer there that he's um, genius, mad genius, pretty crazy. He used to sleep in the studio every day and work. Uh, every time I left at three and then I came back the ne next day, he had done another version during the night. So part of my workaholism probably I learned from him. And, but in, in that studio, I also learned, I think, the most important lesson, and which is also what I want to uh, say here. My, my, uh, my point in this is that, so on the first day, he actually, um, he put me on the listening position and he showed me the track, uh, the pre-master and the master level matched. And he put me there and I was, uh, and he asked me, what did I change? And that second, I thought I was going to lose my job. And I was like, OK, uh, I have no idea what he did. But because I couldn't say, oh, you boosted this frequency or did this or that, because in school, you don't really learn how to listen. You just learn how it what does it, the attack of the compressor do. Um, I just started saying what I heard, which was I felt like the shakers opened a little bit and the vocals came up out a little bit more. And so that's what I told him. And in that day, I noticed that that's the most important thing. And he was like, exactly. And then with time, of course, I started, he showed me what he did to make that happen. And then by the time that I left that studio, I knew how to get to those results. But um, yeah, and this lesson, actually, that listening is the most important thing, is what I use every day. Uh, doesn't doesn't matter which tool. And that's... Uh, uh, the most important thing. So it's about feeling the music and not which frequency was boosted or which how much compression. Of course, these things, you're, you're able to get to these results using these things, but the technical switch. Um, so it's not about the numbers. It's about listening to the music and understanding and feeling the music. And also very important because most of my job is for an artist, it's not my own track. So it's also understanding the vision of the artist. So, yeah. Um, and this is something that you don't, in, in school you learn all the, you know, all the compressor. You have all the like years and years of school teaching you how the tools are, but um, it's not about that. In the end it's about the music. And if you, Listen to music, you're already... I feel like I'm always, always working because even if I'm at a party, I am 100% uh, paying attention to the music that's playing and probably my friends are not very happy to be around me in those parties because I'm always complaining about the sound and all these things. Um, so my workflow also changed a lot in the last years. So that studio that I told you about, it was all analog. And it's great, but it does also uh, have some limitations, of course. So, um, and right now, my, my job, I feel like, so our ears get used to the sound, right? And our ears um, are the best when you first listen to a track, right? You can the best uh, judge what has to be done. So what I, how I work now is I try to do my work as fast as possible. And not to be able to do more jobs and to, I don't know, um, but to have like my ears working at their best potential while I'm working on it. So, um, so what I'm, how I'm working now is that I first go to the studio, listen to the rough mix that they, so I understand what the music is. Then I do a quick version. So I have some presets that I just put it in. Um, maybe it takes me less than half an hour. I do a quick version. Um, then I do a coffee break because we all need coffee. And then after the coffee break, I listen to some references that I have a list of songs that I know very well and I know exactly if, I, like, this one is punchy, this one has the limit of how bright I can go, and this, this one has a very nice, nice low end. So I have. Um, I will show you later in my session how I compare these things. But and I'm using that as my uh, to basically 
tune my ears to that because you know each day we wake up and the ears are working different you know like some days i'm more sensitive to uh to the highs and some some days yeah so and you never know when you wake up so i go to the studio and then i tune my ears and understand how my ears are working that day and that, understanding the your own ears is super important um and then i go back open the session again do another version and and then there I spend a little bit more time, but then I just close it, go to the next track that I have to work on, master, mix, whatever. And then after, maybe like at 4 p.m. after I worked on a few tracks, I go back to the, to the first one that I, that I started the day with and then do a new version. So I work uh, in step-by-step -step doing many versions. And really important, always saving each version. <laughs> Because sometimes the first version was the best, and then you know I don't want to um, get to the last version and be like, oh, what did I do there? And yeah, so always saving versions. And nowadays it's just a small file, right? And if I was using, if I was working all analog, for example, in a mix, that would mean I would have to write down, or there are programs as well, but I would have to, you know, save exactly the the settings that I had for everything. So. I will get to the analog digital thing in a second, but um, and so a very common question as well is what order do I, how do you start a mix, right? And there are no rules for this, but for me, I usually start with the drums because I go very obsessive about the kick very often, and uh, and because it's electronic music, I'm working mostly in, in melodic techno and. Uh, and the kick is super important. And the relation between the kick and the bass. So I always start with the, the kick, then the rest of the drums. Bass, because I'm uh, still focused on the kick and the bass talking together. Then uh, I have synths and l actually vocals are last, which a lot of engineers uh, start with the vocals, but I just, uh, I feel like because I first do a, a, like a shaping the sound of each instrument and cleaning resonances. By the time I get to the vocals, uh, I, I can work on the vocals and then go back to find space for those vocals. Um, and also because it's a genre that vocals are not the main element, right? Um, also a thing that a lot of people think, well, a lot of people do and I don't, is cutting the lows thought I should mention, but we'll see in a, in a bit. And I'm also, as I said, working a lot in presets because I want to be fast. So because I, I don't want to waste my time or my ears time, um, like putting the plug in and because it, it might be two seconds, but it's two seconds that I repeat a thousand times and uh, a thousand times, uh, 20 seconds is a lot. Um, so and I used to think that that was not correct because I thought you had oh you had to open your compressor and do exactly the settings that you want. But the thing is, if you learn the sounds of each preset of your of your plugins, then I'm just choosing the color. You know, like when uh, when I'm working, for example, I'll show you in a little bit. But um, I have a synth, a lead synth. I always go for the same preset. And it's okay because I know that that preset is going to do that, and then why not just use it and make it faster? And uh, why would I struggle to get to that point if I can just, I know the answer, you know? Um, it's just using them as tools and not cheating. Um, and I'm also always trying new tools. So, like, uh, I have my go to limiter right now, but I just got a new one this week because I want to try it out and maybe it's going to be my next uh, go to, you know? Um, yeah, so I'm using a lot of presets and, and mixing and also even mastering. Uh, but I usually have them bypass and then see if it works or not and adjust. And using the tools, but uh, adjusting t for it. Um, and also one thing that I want to mention is my presets are all going against what my ears are like. So for example, I am not really a big fan of like harsh, bright, uh, masters and in the genre that I'm working at right now it's very 
modern and everyone's, everyone wants that sound, right? So how my presets are working is that it's a little bit brighter than it should be. So when I, uh, when I put it on, I'm like, oh no, I have to go down. And then I know that that is the amount that the industry wants. You know, so it's knowing your ears and then working uh, them. Like, I have a template that works with that. So, the question that uh, is very often discussed is between analog or digital, what's better? And I believe that it depends on your workflow, as I said. But for mine, although I love working in my studio, and I, I am usually faster working there, Sometimes life uh, says different things. So if you have a vacation planned and uh, someone really needs a mix and it's a project that re you really want to work on, so you find ways. So I was just on vacation and I planned that this vacation I would not work because all the previous ones I was working. And yeah, ended up that I was working the whole time with terrible Wi-Fi, which was a terrible idea, a lot of headaches and... Uh, yeah, but you, you find time. Yes? Which headphones do you use? Uh, the HD600. I can, I can show you. Can, I, can you ask me again on the questions uh, part? And then I can show you. It's okay, it's okay to ask questions in the middle. It's just, uh, then I can show you exactly my setup because, uh, yeah, the interface part is also, um, yeah. Ask me again later. Um, yeah, and the same way that, like, I'm working in an industry, we're working in an industry that it's, everyone needs everything last minute. You know, like, they could have, they had this track for a long time, I'm sure, but of course they needed it mixed exactly when I was on vacation. And the industry is fast-paced, I have to be fast as well, so I have to adapt. So I, I have a studio with analog gear, I was using it for a long time, then like in a hybrid way, so both digital and, and analog. And, and then I started doing just one track, only digital, and then seeing if anyone would notice a difference. No one did. And then I started uh, doing more and more. And then I noticed also that whenever I did one that was analog and then someone needed a recall months later, because I don't know, uh, it was always a hassle because I had to be they always ask me that when I'm on vacation. And then I'm like, I'm not at the studio. How can I do this? And, and then I just, now I'm just um, working all digital in my studio. And then if I need, I can work from anywhere. And I'm doing that because of the flexibility that it allows me to have. Nowadays, the plugins are really good. You know, like, I believe you can get to the sound uh, that you can get with analog. Probably my, uh, my mentor that I told you about Brazil, I really hope he doesn't see this because he would be really mad. <laughs> he was all analog, all analog. So, But yeah, I believe that the plugins nowadays are, are in a quality that like, it, you can get to the same sounds, you know? Um, most of the time. No, all the time. And I, I want to be fast as I explained, because of my years. And also it's le less maintenance, which is really uh, helpful. And I have to always be available. For example, today. I woke up today with a message on my phone saying, do you think this track needs uh, uh, just mastering or mix as well? And I was like, I think mastering is okay, but you just need to fix this on mix. And then I went to the gym, in the middle of the gym, I get a message like, we need this mix in four hours. I was like, fuck. <laughs> and I had already had a long day planned. So um, I didn't have the studio because I shared the studio with uh, another producer and he has a studio today. And if I was dependent on my studio, I, would be, I wouldn't be able to do the work, right? And I have to always be able to do the work. Um, so I have to always be available. Then I just got my laptop, this my dongles, my headphones, my little interface, which I'll show you later. And I was able to do the work. And now, later, they're playing in ABC, the, the track that I just worked this morning. Uh, also, Corona showed me that because 
uh, had Corona twice, and both times I had work and I had to find ways um, to work. And if I had to be in the studio, I wouldn't be able to do those. Uh, and also, the I have a Dropbox, uh, which you know, using the cloud, it makes it super easy to go from studio to wherever. Um, yeah, so I believe that it's not about the tools that you use, but the decisions that you make and, um, and yeah, and the, the vision that you have for the track. And your ears, of course, you have to practice, like listening is the, the most important thing. Um, so that being said, although you can work with any, uh, any tools, it doesn't need to, you don't need a specific plugin to be able to reach that sound. I believe that uh, it's, if you can get a plugin that can get to those results faster, why not, right? So I uh, made a list also of my favorite. I'll show you in the session, of course. But uh, some of the plugins that I really love um, that I'm using a lot is track spacer does anyone know it do you know yeah. no track spacer yeah so it's a it's a a plugin that i use it a lot to create depth in the mix i'll show you in a second so you're taking a picture of the <laughs> the list um so with track spacer the you can um side chain two elements and not um so it's a dynamic EQ sidechain that allows, I'll show you in a second. I'm really bad at explaining this one. But it allows you to bring an element to the front and another one to the back, right? Invisible limiter is just an amazing limiter, uh, very clean and uh, big fan. Limitless is a, a multi-band limiter that is also really nice. Those are my go-to right now. You'll see in my session I have them a lot. Sugar is, uh, I am addicted to it right now, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, uh, it's what I use for my lead synths and uh, for my bass, for, yeah. Because I, and I have the specific presets in that that I love. It's a multi-band enhancer. I'll show you, it's amazing. And also the split EQ. Have you guys tried the split EQ? No? It changed my life. So it's an EQ that you can EQ separately, the transient and the toner information, which for mastering is amazing because the amount of times that I get a, a, a pre-master that has no kick whatsoever and I have to find it in the low end, and then with a the split EQ, you have a lot more flexibility, right? Um, yeah, but I'll show you that one as well. Uh, another one that I really like is the BX Digital V3. It's a very, it's an MS EQ that is very um, clean, and uh, I use it a lot. It also has a very nice width uh, situation, and Dropbox is a really awesome tool. So um, I'll show you in a session. Quick question. Yes. You say you use presets. Are they your own presets or like presets from the manufacturer? Oh, sorry. Uh, when you say you use presets, are they your own presets or presets from the uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can I can repeat the question as well. Uh, say it again. Oh, yeah. uh, when yeah. so the he asked, is the microphone coming? No? <laughs> Again. Um, so when you say you use presets, are they your own presets or are they presets from the manufacturer? Uh, I do have some presets of my own, but the, the sugar, for example, is or just from the, from the manufacturer. It very often is. I, I, the templates are mine, of course. I, have, uh, I create my templates, but the presets usually is from the manufacturer. And then I tweak a little bit, so. I will show you, but in, for example, sugar, usually it's a bit too much. Then I just start with theirs and then bring it down a little bit. So, um, yeah, my, my, uh, I was going to ask now, um, 
if you guys, how many, how many versions you think uh, I have per track? Any guesses? Four? Four? No, you, you cannot answer. She's not allowed. She's often in the studio with me. Is it this? Okay. How many guesses? I guess four. Four? Ten. Ten? Like 20 He's correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I usually have like 20 versions because I'm doing all small versions, but I think my maximum was 55 versions. But that was a, I really hope I never get to do that again. Because also the, the producer changed stuff and yeah. Um, okay. So I brought here a track from uh, Mind Against that I mixed earlier this year. So I'll play it for you. Let's see if this works.
first thing, as I said, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so first thing, as I said, I always listen to uh, the their demo version, right? So great. Um, so I have uh, I use a lot metric AB, um, which allows me to put. I have a preset here with all the my normal references that I'm usually updating from time to time. But um, these are just tracks that I know uh, that I use as references, and also I have uh, the pre-mix version, or if I'm mastering, also I have the, the pre-master, right? So um, first thing I do is listen to the their pre-mix and think what are the things that I like. I think the kick should be punchier. That's very often the, the case. Or um, we need, it should be wider, or I need more details on the, on the percussion. Um, so I use just the notes of logic to write down all these things. So when I'm working on it, if I forget something, I can go back. And also because I'm working in small steps, it's uh, good so I remember, I, I wanted to do this to this element. Um, so as I said, I usually start with a kick. And so originally the, this kick was, I'm not sure if we'll be able to hear uh, here. So, I wanted it to be a little bit more um, pointy, let's say, but still on the, on the low end, like punchier, right? So, um, and I use this, I, this chain, three of the, the elements are in 95% of my kicks, right? So how I'm doing here, in this one actually, I'm not boosting anything, but usually if it's necessary really, I just, uh, use the transient shaper and give a little bit more attack on the low end. Um, and I would say that my number one thing that really changes so much on the kick and you wouldn't believe it is just changing the phase. So I always, I've always used, even if I'm not using neutron, for example, here, I'm not using it to, um, to give more, like it's not giving more attack but just I'm swapping the phase, which with the, with the bass, if they're not, uh, if they're out of phase, it's just the kick does not come through because uh, you know, you know, like the wave would go against, it would cut, cut each other. So, um, and it's something that you, it's such a small thing, but it makes such a big difference. I can show you, uh, for example, here. If I swap the phase, the kick is gone. So, so this is a big thing. So whenever I first thing I do on, do on a kick is maybe add a little bit more punch uh, with the transient designer and check the phase. And I also at the end I also check the phase again because it might change. Um, then I use the amazing split EQ as I said. So. It changed my life. I can't. I can't uh, put into words how much easier my life is since I have this. Um, so, um, I think the key there. Okay. So, basically, what you can do with this this split EQ is, as I said, you can EQ separately the tonal information and transient information. What does that mean, right? So, if I get, for example this fourth band here. Just the transient information is this. And the tonal information is, right? So if I want if I want it to be, you can use it on a master to separate for a little bit more like the kick and the bass. But on here, what I'm doing is I'm getting the, like the main frequencies of, uh, of the kick usually preferably on the key of the track, right? <laughs> but very often the, the kick is not in the right key of the track, and which makes it a little bit harder on my side. But yeah, so with this, I can try to bring it more, the, the information that I actually want, so to tune to the track. Um, and if not, I'll just go wh wherever the, the actual punch is, but I try. Um, and then, for example, here, this is just a kick. I 
I have, uh, I'm boosting a little bit the, the low punch, right? Which is now at 60. It's usually more like 50, but this one I went for 60. Um, I have the higher punch at 130. And, and here at 96. So I'm just boosting a little bit in each frequency, just a tone. The, before I was using, before I had split EQ in my life, I was using just a normal EQ. But with this, it's way easier. Uh, and then I also have a little bit more, I, I felt like it was missing the clicky sound of the kick. So I also open it here. Um, and then lastly on my chain, usually um, I want the kick a little bit more rounder. So I'm usually just limiting it a little bit and then adding a little bit of saturation if necessary. And on this one, I also, uh, the low, this was a tricky one with, usually with the, this type of kick is uh, tricky with the bass and the, the toms. So I also control, control it a little bit more the low end with this, um, yeah, it's, it's a limiter, multi-band limiter, but yeah. But I don't always use this. It's, it was just a specific case, but the other three, I'm very often using it for the punchy kick. Um, then after dealing with my kick, I, I, later I go back to the kick a trillion times, but the first time. <laughs> um, then I go through usually hi-hats because usually you have many of them and finding space, you know the table, putting, finding space for each one, so making some some have to be a little bit wider, some need to be a little bit more in your face. So I go through all the hi-hats and, and I see what I have because, yeah. So there's more like symbols, shakers, and then fast hats. And there was another one that they took out <laughs> in the middle of my mix. They were like, ah, oh, maybe let's just take that one. And, and then there are hi-hats. So many hats, which are really important, all of them. So uh, what I usually do is go through all of them and then see which one I'm going to position where. So for example, um, here, this one. I can't tell because it's only I can uh, it's only on one side here in Simono, but I'm guessing what Julia of the past did is bringing it a little bit forward because I used the transient. Uh, yeah, I just gave a little bit more attack. Um, and then for the next one, for example, I left it as it was. It was already pretty wide. Mm. No, this one was pointy, and it was sitting exactly where it should be. It's just a little detail. But the shakers, for example, I wanted it wider. Uh, this was a tricky one. So with wider, I have a few. I always go, first I try the S1 imager from Waves. I love it. But sometimes when it's already really wide, it becomes uh, narrower. So if that doesn't work, I usually try a, a mid-side uh, EQ. To, and then try to bring up the highs of, the, of only the sides. And so I, with this one, I tried all of them. And then in the end, I just decided to do a little doubler. So to try to open a little bit more. And then I felt like it was missing, it was too back in the mix. So I gave a little bit more, uh, I used the transient designer to bring it uh, a bit more attacky. Um, then I put a, a reverb on the track. Don't tell any of my teachers in school. And then I, I did the shake, the, the S1. So this was actually an element that I spent a lot, a lot of time trying different things. Uh, each version, a different tool that I tried and ended up uh, with this. Um, 
So I go through all of them and then try to, for example, here I opened a little bit more the highs and um, finding the, the characteristic that each I had that they gave me, what they meant with that, which is always a tricky thing. Um, then on this one, we also have uh, claps that fill, like, right? Which are really important, uh, and it's it's what keeps changing on the track and keeps the the drop interesting. So um, originally it was a little bit less punchy, and I felt like it was missing character. So I gave it a, a little bit more um, attack on the like lower mids and also overall. So it would come out a little bit more in the mix. And usually, usually when I'm doing these things of bringing things forward and bringing things back, usually it ends up that everything's a little bit too forward. And then on the next version, I just bring things that shouldn't be so forward a little bit to the back. Um, then, there is also a clapless. So this one, I just wanted to open a little bit more to give a little bit more texture on the sides. So I opened a little bit the, um, just the highs on the side and gave a little bit more room because it was too dry. Then uh, all of these are going through uh, my um, chain that I always use. So one of the things that I do when I st first start the mix is just routing these things to, through my presets, right? The templates. So this is just a little bit of uh, parallel compression, a little bit of saturation, uh, and cutting a little bit the lows of all, all of these things, although I don't always have this on. Um, and, of course, I also have uh, a reverb. Ah, maybe I should have added this one also to my favorites. Amazing reverb. Um, yeah, so I always use this reverb for my... Uh, always is a strong word, but 95% of the time I use this for my, um, for my drums. Exactly this preset. If, uh, try it out, it's amazing. It's a Bricasti emulation, it's beautiful. Um, so, so those are the drums. Um, ah, and also parallel to that um, template that I have, I have the NLS uh, <coughs> magic trick. Does anyone know this? No? So, do you know uh, Malamente, the song from Rosalia? No, yeah, cool. So basically, there's a, a mix with the masters, you know, that uh, platform with a lot of uh, vid awesome videos. So Jason Joshua mixed Malamente. And basically when he uh, got uh, the, the session, um, there was a track full of NLSs, uh, which is just an analog summing uh, from uh, Waves. Really cheap, really, um, yeah. So he had a um, he had it just in the session, and he was like, "Someone did, someone fucked it up. Why why is this here?" And he muted it, and then the depth was gone, because it just it's magical. So I tried it out with my um, with my preset. So I just put it next to it, and uh, and with time and time, I, I started changing it a little bit here and there, but it just. No one knows why, it's just the summing and, and the color that it's adding, but it adds depth to the drums. And I don't send my kick there because um, I feel like it usually kills a little bit of the, for, for electronic music, it doesn't work so well. But for the rest, toms, sometimes not, but for the rest, it's amazing. So I can show. So this is without NLS, the, the level is gonna change, but this is with. Maybe here you won't be able to notice, I don't know. But without, with, right? 
it's amazing. So all that it is is a specific order of the same plugin eight times. So it's Mike, Spike, Mike, Mike. You can watch the, the YouTube, uh, the Mix with Masters video. But I swear, um, I really care about the depth of the mix. Um, and this, I can't explain, but it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, if you are only sending the drums to this bus, or if I'm always? You only? Only, sending yeah. Drums so I only have, I used to use it, I, for, for some time I, I was using also in some synths, but I ended up uh, finding other ways to get to the depth that I wanted with the synths. But yeah, so I'm sending, uh, actually on this track, for example, I'm not sending the toms because the toms became a little bit weak, but I'm sending all of these basically, like all the highs of the drums. Um, yeah, so that's basically all with the drums. Um, and also, sometimes it's good if you use the NLS, it's sometimes good to have a gate because it might add some, because it's, it's uh, summing, um, analog summing, it's adding noise. So sometimes I, if it's too noisy, it's good to uh, close, uh, to have a gate to close it. Um, and then, let me drink some water, otherwise I die. But then we go to the bass. Um, and so as I said, a really important thing with the bass is the conversation between the bass and the kick, right? And for this, although it, uh, it would usually be that you do the other way around, I actually start my bass for some reason always doing the side chain um, because the kick is really important and I feel like the, the bass should be talking to the kick and, um, and not, the kick is the main element and the, kick is, the bass is around it. So when I'm shaping my bass, I want the kick, uh, I usually do it with the kick together. So I usually start with uh, putting um, my side chain um, as usual. Then I also have usually a little, uh, even more sidechain as a multiband um, uh, compressor. So I have here in the low end, and then only acting on the on this range, and on the upper, like the clicky of the sound of the the of the kick. Here I also have it for my toms. Yeah, because I was struggling with the low end and this one. So I also did the same with the, with the, the um, cause on the, these toms you have two different toms. So one for each. And then this one I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but this is to, to give space to the synths. Um, and that's the track spacer that I mentioned before that is amazing. Um, and then as you can see on this base, I only have sugar this beautiful thing that I need to update. Um, yeah, so I'll show you how the bass was before. Just a long note, so in... But it was disappearing in, um, and I wanted to give a little bit more attention to it. So I did a little bit more of a push on the mids which is a preset from Sugar, from Sugar, uh, that you just find here. It's not mine, it's just theirs. They have amazing presets. And it's actually a little lower. Mm. There's something wrong. Okay. There's also a bug with this uh, plugin. Now they fixed it, but sometimes it still shows. Um, yeah, so without and with, and even if, if I'm level match a little bit more, oh. 
-hmm. Yeah, so it's giving a little bit more of a push in the mids, adding some color. And the cool thing with this one is that you can, you have the different bands, right? And you have two different colors that you can add to each band. So you can have, for example, the low, low end can be thick or punchy. So for example, this is a long note, so it wouldn't make sense to have it punchy. But if I have a rolling bass, for example, it's really useful. Um, then the mids, you can have it warm or broad. With the highs, you have shine or excite. And then with the, the air, you have in and young. What it means, we don't know. We just try them out and see. So, yeah. And really cool also, you have, uh, the, you can add this drive or distortion to the, um, um, to the whole thing. And my favorite thing, you can add, uh, make it work on it as stereo or MS. So I will show you, I can show you now as well on the, for example, on the lead, I'm using a lot in MS. So we have mid and side that you can control separately, which we'll get there in a little bit, but uh, it gives you more flexibility, right? Um, and then, for example, with this one, we have we have okay pretty similar. So I just use the same thing. Um, so it would have space. So without, uh, in the context of the song. And with. It gives a little bit, brings it, brings it forward a little bit, right? And then I go to the synths. And with the synths, uh, it usually, you have a lot more of them. And it, for me, it's important to organize them in my session. As you can see, I have all my colors uh, and naming all of this. It's uh, super important. Um, but on the synths, I also separate them as the front synths and the back synths because some synths are like pads or more, are not leads, you know, leads have to go to the front. And I usually separate them um, with these buses, right? So I have all of these going to my, to the front of the mix. Those are, are my, um, the, the elements that I want to bring forward and the middle ones are the ones that I want to give depth to the, to the track with. Um, and so on my synths uh, on the bus, just like I have on my bass, I have uh, the multiband. Now, I don't use the full compressor uh, to sidechain because then it's too aggressive and hearable. So I just do on the low end. And apparently here, I did also hear uh, on the higher punch because they were fighting. Um, and on the click key of the kick on this one. But usually I just leave just a low end to be side chained. So, so whenever the kick whenever the kick hits, it side chains, right? It compresses. Um, and also with the toms because I had problems with the low end in this one. Um, and this was me doing little tweaks at the end, very likely. Also, uh, as I said before, the snare on this one was really important for the, for the drop. So I wanted to give space for it. Uh, and the synths, the synths were taking too much space. So I also did a, a little side chain here with the multiband to give space. Uh, when, when, when it hits, it goes down. Uh, it compresses. So, um, and then let's go through the front uh, synths. So on this one we have this lead. 
that originally was a little bit darker and less less aggressive, let's say. So on this one, I used my favorite sugar, um, the preset from from them, which is called Synth MS Lead Punch, and. As I said, this one is an MS. Um, uh, it's in the MS option. So, with in this way, I can bring this lead a little bit forward, just in the in the in the center. So, and choosing which frequency I want. So, and giving. So I add a little bit of distortion, and um, with the mid option, bringing this element more to your face. So without, with. Without. And it is, of course, adding, it's adding a little bit of uh, volume as well, but it also it's adding a color and shaping the sound, which is the color that I want. So 90% of the lead, 75% of the leads in, in this genre right now are very similar to this. So this presets work, works very often. And um, yeah, but the original preset, of course, is a lot harsher, a lot stronger. I can show you as well. Um, so, if you go... It's, a li it's amazing, but it's a little bit buggy, this, sense, this uh, plugin sometimes. Okay, so you can see it's a, a lot stronger, right? Um, for example, here it's bringing the the highs a lot more, and I just shaped it how I wanted it. So uh, I felt like it was usually it's it's too much highs, and then usually it's missing a little of mids, and and then I'm changing to however I want it using my ears. Um, then in this one we also have this. Um, this vocal chop that I didn't feel like it needed anything uh, really, so I my uh, I don't have any inserts. I just gave it depth, which we'll get there in a little bit. And it has also this synth percussion thing, which is always the element that when I start working on it, I'm like, is it a percussion? Is it a synth? Um, and then I move it around the session. Go, it goes to the drums part, it goes down, and this one is the synth, so. Um, and with this one, I added a little bit more attack. Because with that, you bring it a little bit forward in the mix. And I also actually cut the lows in this one and, and open a little bit the highs. So with the highs, what, I like what I was uh, intending is to bring it a little bit more detail and uh, bring it a little bit forward. And then with the, I had problems with the low end in this track, so I cut the lows here. Also, I, yeah, it also has a lot of low end information that you actually don't need. Um, this element, they took it out of the song. So, yeah, and then all of these, I have, <coughs> I have them going um, to the synth depth, which I'm just using. It's not even that this is a preset. This is, is the initial, like, default <laughs> um, preset of Raum. And then I just, I always tweak a little bit. So it, it's usually 50%. I put it to 100%. I add a little bit more feedback because it uh, has a delay into the reverb. And I usually want it a little bit more like like longer and more details. And um, I very rarely change the, the actual um, 
sound. I really like the airy one. Um, and I also, because I was having problems with the low end in this one, I also did the side chaining with the multiband on the on this uh, reverb. Um, and then all of my synths are going to uh, another reverb, which is the Valhalla, amazing. And this is uh, the preset, the default preset of <laughs> Valhalla. Um, yeah, but it's, uh, for me, like I've tried all of the colors of the Valhalla and for the synths, it's just, it's the most beautiful one. So I very often go with this one. Um, then if I go check my, um, the synths a little bit, uh, like the pads and the, the things that are more giving the, not the leads, but giving the, the space and the feeling. Um, we have here. This pad that was already sounding really good. So I didn't really add anything to it apart from track spacer, but um, this is not changing the character of the sound that much. Um, we have this, these strings that are really important. And with this one, uh, the original sound is... Um, I felt like it was a little bit weak in the low end so uh, when I heard it I was like it, it lacks like that deep uh, low end and Max Bass has a, an amazing preset called the ultra low extender um, so with this one On this one, I can't really hear the difference, but when you have a sub, can you hear it there? <laughs> yeah, good, because uh, we don't hear those frequencies here. But in a club, you would hear it, or it, like these are usually played and you have big subs, so it's important. Um, so I just extended it a little bit to give like the lower depth uh, to the strings. And then I opened a little bit um, the highs because uh, I wanted to make the, the track a little bit wider and, and then I was looking for elements that could that I could open and this was a strong one. So, but then I left the low end exactly how it is and I'm just opening the highs so, so it uh, takes that space. Um, and I'll go to this magical tool in a little bit. Um, then next we have a, this lead. And this one was actually a tricky one because when I first did the first version, I saw it more as a an, in the front element. And then after talking to the artist and doing a few versions, um, we brought, brought it back in the mix. So I put it in the other category and tweaked according to that. But then as you see, for example, here, I started with the lead, uh, my lead sound, and then I brought it even down and down and down. So uh, bringing it a little bit back to the mix. And also I made it a little bit uh, wetter with the, with the reverb. So this sound. just a it's, a it's about understanding what this sound means and before I inter interpret it as a lead but uh, it's more of a a feeling in the in the in the back of the mix right um, and we also have 
here I just gave a little bit more body to this uh, glide uh, chord. <laughs> And opened a little bit because I was looking to make the, my track wider. Um, usually, actually, with effects, I don't do much, as you can see here. Maybe if there's one that I that I feel... So, for example, here I opened a little bit the riser, the highs, but I don't usually do that much. Because usually when, when I get the tracks, it's already... The, the artist already put the risers how, how they want it. Maybe I give it a, a little bit of color here and there, but not, not often. But what I always do, of course, is the side chaining um, with the multiband for the kick to come through. Um, and the last thing, so I go through all of these track, the, the tracks and I put them, um, shape them how, where I want to put in the table. And very often, almost always, you need a little bit more space. And these elements have to talk to each other. Um, so, for example, my bass was very often taking a bit of space from my leads, from my synths. So, so track space here allows me to sidechain these two elements. So whenever the synth plays, it EQs this a little bit and that, that creates an amazing depth because you're putting one element a little bit more forward. And um, I usually choose the band. So for example, I, I don't want the bass to lose the power on the low end because that's what the bass is most likely doing uh, there. Um, so I just, I can EQ here, I can choose a frequency where it starts acting. Um, and just using just a little bit, like 5%. Like if you're, if you're doing more than 10%, it's too much. Um, and then uh, choosing which element goes forward and which ones go back to the back. So for example, here, I wanted the synths to come forward on, top of, uh, on the highs on top of the bass. So I put the, on the bass, I put track spacer uh, with all the, the synths. And if you go here, you also have the possibility to work in MS or left and right. Uh, I usually go for MS because I feel I feel like it makes more sense in this kind of music where you don't have like you don't have the hi hat in one side. You know, it's usually just a matter of opening them equally in this direction. So um, for me, it doesn't make much sense to work in left and right. I don't want it to unbalance that. Uh, so with this using MS, what I can guarantee is that, for example, the leads are going to be, the, the synths are going to be in the middle and strong or on the sides. And you can also pan how, if you want this to act more on the mid or on the side, which is very nice. Uh, and I use this a lot. And actually, I was talking, a, f a friend of mine showed me this, this plugin. And then he, um, he was telling me about, the, he was doing this mix and he was struggling to, like, weeks later, he was like, I'm struggling to make this, this vocals come through on the mix. And I was like, why don't you use track spacer? Like, you showed me this, this plugin. And then he was like, oh, but that's cheating. I mean, I am cheating all the time. Uh, I, ju I just want to, why, why make it more complicated, you know? And for example, here, uh, as I said, I have the front synths and the back synths, right? And of course, I want to bring the front synths to the front. So what I will do is uh, go on my middle synth, the back synth, um, and then do a, uh, the sidechain track spacer. So they have their space. So all, I could do track by track, but then it would take too much um, CPU and my session would be super heavy and I wouldn't be able to work. So I just do in the, in the whole bus. And again, just 5%. And this time, I left the high, the, the high frequencies and the lows uh, because I wanted the details to, to be there. And I can show you. So just a synth. So if, I don't know if you guys are using uh, Logic, but if it's gray, it's off. If it's on, if it's uh, blue, it's on just so I can A, B here. So 
So it's just a subtle uh, difference. But that when you do with all the all the elements and you bring forward one element here and there and you can also automate them to have that synth coming in front. It's like, I, I always like to think it's, it's like a, um, a, a video. Like if you have a music video of a band playing, you wouldn't like to have the whole band playing the whole time, right? You want to have a little focus on each element each time. So, yeah. Um, so that's what I'm doing here, is I'm giving the attention to each element in each time. Um, then, yeah, then with, with the effects, I'm usually not doing much, just the side chain, what has to be, like the kick. And then here, I also did with the low chord group, apparently. Forgot about that one. Which, here. because we were having problems with the, with the impact not coming through. And then I put track, uh, track spacer there. And then um, all of these are going through my master chain, which is uh, usually I am using 90% of the time these ones because it's the ones that I I love the sound and that I know the best how to make sound how I want. And, and two others that now I'm using that here I'm not, but I can uh, show you. Um, so this is a, the uh, MS EQ that I uh, mentioned before. And what I, re what I really like about it is that I can control things mids and sides separately. And I can also, uh, it has a really nice width function, which I just do a little bit, because if you do too much, you, uh, I can show you the extremes, so you can have an idea of what it does. So, can you hear the width there? Because I can't hear, yeah, <laughs> cool. So, and it really, I never go more than 120%. But if you just put a little bit, it gives your master or your, your track a little bit, um, makes it a little bit bigger. You just have to be careful that the, your low end doesn't become too wide as well because then your kick stop, uh, it's not punchy enough and all these things. So, um, And then I also use it a little bit to shape. Sometimes I need the, the lead to be a little, uh, the high mids to be a bit more aggressive and you can use just the mono, uh, the mid for, uh, section of it. Um, I also usually give a little bit of air on the track. And this one I also opened a little bit the, because I, I was trying to open my whole uh, track, uh, the width, so I also boosted the, the highs here. So. Okay. so if you have the... So just this on the size boosting. Um, then I'm using Limitless, which is a really amazing um, limiter, multiband limiter, that um, I'm usually just doing a little bit just so it doesn't uh, move too much, but just subtle, as you can see. But you can, what I, I'm also using it a lot, almost as an EQ actually. So now, this is before I, I was started using the invisible limiter, which I can show you as well how I would do it, uh, which is a very clean limiter. So how I'm actually, right now, how I'm working, this was a few, a couple months ago. So how I'm doing now, because I'm always changing a little bit, is I'm going just, to right before it moves, actually moves the, the limiter, that is actually, and, and then I, um, I use this as a, almost an EQ, so like if I, now, now in this genre it's very common to have that really harsh high, so I 
you can bring it out a little bit here. So it's a little bit more aggressive in your face. And, uh, and then just bringing up the, my level a little bit on the, on the invisible lifter. And the, the default preset is amazing on the, the, on the invisible limiter. But always with limiters, you have to be careful also that you don't distort. Um, so that's always the tricky, that's, that's why I, I use separate limiters because uh, this way I can reach louder without forcing any limiter too much. Um, a lot of engineers are against using multi-band limiters, by the way. Uh, but it's because you change the the level and how the 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 mix is. But because I'm I'm not using it too much, uh, not bringing it uh, going too hard on it, it's okay. Although I did use it very hard in the past. Um, but as long as it sounds good, that's what matters, right? Um, and then. Um, yeah, so this is usually what I'm doing here. And we can A, B now. Wait, let me go back to how it was, more or less. Um, the original track, so the, the premix was, oops. So originally the track was like this. So orange is the uh, premix, and then uh, A is my uh, blue is my my mix and master. So all I'm trying to do the whole time is. Uh, clean things that I don't need, bring things forward, bring things back. And, and then also on the master. So I also uh, brought here, for example, a, a master that I did. So only master, not in the mix. If the spinning wheel of death allows me. <laughs> Great. And actually, when I'm just mastering, I'm using Pro Tools. Um, OK, let's uh, kill it. Um, so I brought this track was released actually earlier this week, I think. Yeah. Um, and this one I did, did just the, the master. Mm-hmm. Any questions for now? Okay. Um, I have a question to the mix. Uh, do you use any automation? On the mix, or was it all done? Yeah. So, um, what I was explaining before with the um, with the video of how each element has uh, their moment, I'm using a lot of automations there as well. Is it more like volume automation, or do you like automate the stereo width of a synth when it comes to also, drop and stuff? Also, yeah, mostly uh, not not that much in volume. Usually more in the plugins. Do you use any clipper in mastering? Uh, actually, the 
uh, as I said, that I was just have a new uh, plugin that I started trying this week, and yeah, it's a it's, it's two clip as well. Yeah, but right on, on this one, I, I didn't use. Hmm. And you had a question. Ah, oh, he has a question. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Um, so, thank you as well. Um, and I was just wondering, what can I, as an as a producer, do different in my productions to make your life easier, or to rephrase it, if you are or if you would be a producer yourself, what would you be doing different? Hmm. I think a, very often people come to the mixing engineer expecting us to change the sound design, um, which is a really important. Get some feedback here, uh, which is really important. Uh, like sound design is eighty percent of 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 the sound. You know, like there's sure I can put sugar and bring it um, a little, like bring the, the the lead a little bit forward and all of this. But if the sound design is not there, I I will not. I can't save it. You know, and. Yeah, that's usually a big problem. Like also the kick, choose the right sample for the kick, and and then the mix will be easy. You know. Uh, yeah. So. So I need to get better, yeah. Huh? <laughs> Come again? I need to get better at what I'm doing, right? No, just uh, pick your sounds carefully. Don't don't expect to save on the next step of the process, right? You can't save the mix. Um, save the mix on the on the master. You should do every step the best you can, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And you have a question as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Super interesting. Um, so you said you do some mixes and mastering work like while you're out on vacation and just I'm assuming then using headphones. Mm -hmm. um, working mostly in like a small room with monitors where I don't hear below end as much as I would like to. How do you approach mixing uh, below end when you don't have access to you know like a big sub to really be able to hear it? I um, I think so. If I would be in a room where I have two speakers and I have to mix a track. The room, if the room is not treated and I have headphones, I will go for the headphones. Because uh, with, first of all, the room is always affecting the sound, right? The best mix I've ever heard, did in my life, I've never, it was actually in a room that was not treated. And then when I heard it in headphones, I, I noticed that it was the worst one. So, yeah, like it's, it's important to like know your, the sound that you, like your reference, right? So. I, they already asked me before, so I'll, I'll bring out my headphones. <laughs> uh, for example, I have here, now you're going to see my mess in my... I should have prepared this better. Um, so I'm using the HD600, and I know them... Um, like, I, I know them almost more than I know my, my studio, you know, because uh, I'm always checking when I, even when I work in the studio, I check on those and, and that's what matters. And it doesn't need to be this one specifically. Test, like I tested many different uh, headphones before finding these ones uh, being the best for me. So um, you can, you have stores in Berlin, like just music that you can go there and try all of them, right? And with the speakers is the same. So. Just find one that, like, this one goes uh, as on the subs, on the lows. Uh, you just have to understand how they are. So I know, for example, that they don't have a really strong low end. And for a while, I was always using the HD25, which is the DJing headphone, to check the low end. But now, because I already worked on them so many times, I already know how the low end sounds here. And I know how they're going to translate in my studio or in a club. Um, yeah, so you don't really need much to be able to do this, you know? Like, a lot of people say that you need the, all the gear in the world. I believe that you can, you just need this and a computer. But 
Yeah, and uh, just choose your, the headphones that. If you, if I were, if I was working in a studio that was not treated, and that, that doesn't have the low end, I would find headphones that uh, that I trust to be able to work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so going back now that the session is open, um, I have here a track from Anima that was released. Earlier this week, so on this one, for example, I have here, as I said, all my uh, exactly the same references as before, and I have the pre-master. So we can A B how the track was before. So orange is pre-master, uh, blue is the master. Actually, the AB that we're doing now is with their demo master from before, so it's already level matched. Um, and so when I got this one, for example, actually I got uh, many versions because they wanted, uh, they changed a lot of things, but this is the final one. Um, so I did very, very little EQing here for the uh, first step. So I just brought, brought out a little bit of uh, 73 hertz. So like, for the kick. So I wanted to the kick to uh, come out of the mix a little bit more. Um, gave a little bit more attack overall because I know that this artist, he really likes uh, this very aggressive sound. External, external, over. So, so I can, I'll show you also how I go step by step, right? So, so, just adding a little bit more aggression with the transient. Um, and then I bring out my favorite uh, split EQ and uh, exactly as I did with the kick before, I do it on a master. Um, so I added a little bit more punch to the low end because I know that this artist uh, is um, really, uh, he really cares about um, the aggressiveness. And um, uh, So here I have, and this one it doesn't translate that well, but the lower punch of the kick. Then again, I have the higher punch, the mid punch. And the higher punch. So, and overall, I also had added a little bit more. And when I did that, I felt like the kick and the bass were still not talking to each other that well. So I also removed a little bit of the tonal information of the low end. So. With this, with the metric AB, you can also just hear the low end, which is very nice. And I use it very often to check these things. Um, so, it's almost a little bit boomy. So, by removing a little bit of the, of the tonal information there, it's a lot clearer and um, as you can notice, I really care about the low end. I spend a lot of time fixing that. 
Uh, then I did actually the same here um, as I did on the kick of the previous track, only on the, tr the kick, uh, which is to limit it a little bit and just the low end of the track. Just to round the low end a little bit more. Um, then, same thing as I did in a previous track. I opened a little bit of the width of the, of the track, uh, gave it a little bit more air. Open the, the highs of the sides. And I wanted a little bit more aggression because I know that uh, Matteo likes it that way. So I also uh, brought out a little bit of 2.3K. Uh, and this is, for example, a step on my preset that I go a little bit harder than I, what I will need to adjust to my ears. So, for example, on my preset, I have this boosted at 3.5. So whenever I put my preset and I listen to it, it's already like, oh, it's so harsh. And then I bring it down and then I'm bringing it down to the sound that is, is actually what I, um, not what my ears would go for, but what the industry uh, is sounding like. Um, then, same as I did before, I was getting a little bit louder, um, on this one, for example, as I said, I'm, uh, using this almost as an EQ. This one is actually coming from a preset of Limitless. I don't remember originally. Ah, it's Wake Up My Mix, the original uh, preset that I changed a little bit to to my um, to my needs. Let's say. Um, so I have here a little bit more of 1K uh, to give a little bit of aggression but still body. Then a little bit of aggression, a little bit more of the hi-hats information, and then air. And this is just uh, basically what I do here is I go through the references. For example, another track of, of this artist that um, that I know that he likes the sound of. This a little bit part of the track. Yeah. So I'm just A being and seeing does it feel like it's missing highs or it's weak or And for example, uh, this one, the running, the other track, is one that it wouldn't be this loud if it wasn't for the sound, de sound design. It was sound designed to be loud and aggressive. Um, and I know that this is the sound that uh, he was going for with this track, so I'm use I use it a lot to compare the two. Then I'm using the invisible limiter to actually bring my, my level up. <laughs> And lastly, I just have, uh, I always put the Pro L to the end just to avoid, because it, in the invisible limiter is not a true peak limiter, and just to avoid that it peaks. Um, I put it just to keep um, a little bit, 0 0.2 dBs. Um, on this one, actually, I also did a, a bit of automation because I felt like the drop was hitting the right spot um, on the level on the on how much compression it was going, but the the rest of the track I felt like it needed a little bit more breathing, so I did a really small automation here of I think 0 0.5, yeah, just so it's limiting a little bit less. <laughs> Thank you. 
but it's very very subtle if I also if I go back to how it was this is the point that you go into the little obsessions in the master um, but that that matter you know uh, okay so this is how it and with the with the automation with a little a little bit less especially especially this lead can breathe more which is important um, so I decided to do this little automation on this one and yeah this one took seven versions um, but feel but yeah but a lot of different uh, versions also on their side so they changed the um, arrangement and some sounds as well so yeah um, so now, uh, any questions? Actually, he, uh, you asked me before also for the headphones, and because I started working a lot remotely, uh, I for some time I, I like right now I actually don't want to use any plugins that make me uh, have to have any. Hardware, so UAD, for example. Although now they have the the new UAD Spark, which will allow you to work without the DSP. Um, I stopped using UAD because I always needed to have the interface with me, and for for a few weeks I was working directly with the headphone in, but it it wasn't so good. And then I found this really small interface just for the headphones that uh, from Apogee, and that's what I'm using now. So I'm using these headphones with um, just this interface that is so tiny that I can put in my pocket. I always have it in my backpack when I go on vacation, when I go anywhere, um, that I can work and being able to be flexible and of course, in the studio, I have a proper interface that uh, and converters that I can um, that is better to work. But being able to have to be flexible to be able to work on my headphones is really important. So um, it's not only the headphones, also this uh, beauty, beautiful little thing as well. Um, yeah, so it's Groove from Apogee. I'm not getting paid to say this, but it's. Um, yeah, so that's basically my setup. So if I have my laptop, this headphones and the dongles, I am able to work from anywhere. I don't have to rely on uh, understanding the room, as I said, with, you know, like if the speakers that you know, if you move to a different room, they're not the same. So I have my, my studio as my safe haven, and then I have my headphones that I really trust to be able to work. Uh, anywhere. Um, yeah. So, any questions? Yes. Um, that uh, depth uh, thing on the drums in the previous um, example, um, you said something about there is a specific order of the Mico, Spico, Neve, SSL thing yeah. type. Uh, is there? You have a, can we do a screenshot or you have yeah, a yeah, video? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think uh, there is a, a mix with the master's video, but you need the subscription of the, uh, the thing. But I can show you. I'll try to open all of them here and then you can take a picture. <laughs> okay, but it's you. eight plugins. <laughs> But to be honest, I think it's just a random order. Like I've tried uh, many different ones because. But it's, it's, it's like 
There are screenshots online about ah, especially okay. this, and there's people on Reddit. They go through Mix with the Masters, they screenshot everything, and they put <laughs> and it online. So yeah, you, you can, can also basically get all this, the, the chains. I think you can even find the, the, the preset, the setting. But yeah, the, the, if you search Mix yeah, with the Masters. And now it's already open. Now you're getting it. Uh, I can do a screenshot for you. Uh, right. It's going to be hard. It's a small screen. You can find it online. <laughs> yeah, or if, you, if, if you're using Logic, you can. I can also. Uh, Jason Joshua is the name of the guy. Jason Joshua. Yeah. But it's a really useful uh, trick for sure. Any other questions? So for um, mixed down, how do you level? Like you use some sort of metering visualization, or do you level by ear, or just like the visual you get by like the track uh, spaces from ear. Logic? Ear. Um, usually, if if the track is if I get the multi tracks that are way too loud, I will gain stage it a little bit, but I don't um, I don't stress too much about gain staging to minus eighteen or whatever. I just bring it down a little bit and. And then by year, I level everything. Because in the end, no one's going to actually, like, when the listener listens to it, they're not going to be checking on the meter or anything, right? It's just about feeling and listening. Any other questions? Thank you for your question. So have you done entire mixes and mastering projects on that small interface that you got, like, while you're on the road? Yes. Okay. So. For us producers who might be on the road, uh, it would behoove us to get the best result possible for the mastering engineers to at least have that instead of going off of our headphone jack while we're on the road. Yeah, and that, that's the thing. Like, it's, of course, it's a subtle difference. You could, like before I was working, actually, I did a, for example, in October, I was supposed to have uh, three days off and I was going to go to ADE. And I didn't bring my interface or my headphones, but I had DJing headphones because I was supposed to bring it for uh, to because the artist threw it to the cl the crowd and the, whatever. I went later. I was gonna bring the headphones, <laughs> and and then I, I they needed a mix and I I didn't have my headphones that I really trust. So what I did, I just got the HD 25s and uh, that that I was bringing for them, and I listened to some tracks. And I did the mix there and, and also master. I, it's not optimal, of course. I prefer finishing things in the studio, but um, we, like, it, if you're in an island and you want to open a coconut and you don't have a knife, are you going to starve or are you going to use a, a rock, you know? So, yeah, so Thank it's you. about knowing your, your speakers or your headphones. And the interface helps. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a perfect headroom you need uh, to to make the best of the mix? Uh, like minus nine dB or minus. 12 I don't. Or? I don't care about th that that much, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I mean, it of course, because I will. If you send me and it's, it's usually too loud. It's not usually too low. So I would just bring it down. As long as it doesn't clip, I can work with that. Okay. You know, um, as long as long as it's not. What you give me is super distorted and clipping in. It's usually OK. Any other questions? OK. Yeah. Um, so I noticed you were using Split EQ, but also Fab Filter Pro EQ. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any big difference? Like, am I missing something? Because yeah, from so my understanding, they can accomplish kind of a similar thing. No. The different thing is with, with split, wait, if I open. So with a pro Q, you can have, a, you can have it in mid side. You can have it in left, like stereo. You can EQ in that way, right? But with split EQ, the different thing is that you can EQ just the transient information or just the tunnel. So same frequency here, for example. 
This would be the normal EQing, so it's both the tonal and the transient information. Wait a second. Okay. Let me take out the cue there. So this this is the this whole frequency, all the information that is there. But I can also just EQ or listen to right to just the transient information. Of course, it stopped now. Great. Yeah. So. This is just a transit or also the tonal information, which is, so it's two different shapes. So with the kick, it's a little bit harder to show, but for example, if I go uh, on the master, it's, uh, it's clearer. So if I used it, and this one I didn't have, uh, split EQ. So, for example, if I... This is the transient information. This is the tonal information. Right, so being, being able to control these separate colors or um, parts of the sound, it gives, you, it gives you a lot more flexibility. And both are really important. I'm, I'm using both a lot. It's just they're doing different things, you know? Got it. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Cool. Then uh, that's all uh, for today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, yeah, I'll be around for a little bit outside also if anyone wants to ask questions and thank you. Thank you.